Thank you. And I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. And thank you, Bill and Dean. Um, so yeah, I just recently moved. Oh, OK. Just say that. I just recently moved from Duke to a position at the AI Institute at the University of Leipzig and the Max Planck Institute for Math and the Sciences. And this is a joint work with uh, long-term collaborators of mine, uh, Kevin McGough and Andrew Nobel, and one of my students at Duke, uh, uh, Lang Xuan Zhu. So start. Uh, I'll start with actually an example. Being a statistician, we're always thought, you know, start with something maybe in the real world. So uh, this is in the real world. This is my collaborator. It's actually not my collaborator. It's a device my collaborator set up, which is an artificial gut. And what you can do is you can take a fecal sample, put it in there, and then you can start kicking in probiotics. And you can ask how quickly does the community of microbiomes, uh, microbial objects change. And these are the types of results that you get. And you can take these noisy count data and model them as time series. And typically what you can do, this is what's called a dynamic linear model, it's a generalization of a common filter, is you have your states being updated. These are the natural, or the biological perturbations, then there's noise, and then there's kind of a, something which takes these kind of real values and turns them into your noisy count data. And you might want to figure out how much biological variation is versus technical variation, for example. And so if I want to write this out as a model, ah, sorry, I can write out this. And this is very much like a common filter, plus or minus, but it's a time varying, it's with time varying parameters. Okay, so getting that out of the way, can you prove something about these models? Can you say that they're converging to something? What can you say, okay? So let's go back to the non-time varying thing and just look at classical statistical learning theory. You have X's and Y's, you're trying to learn a function, you're doing regression effectively, and what you want to say is it's going to predict well on out of sample data. Okay. And under what conditions can you learn? Under what conditions is an algorithm that goes from data to a good out function estimate of hat? Now, here's a terrible one, which is just put down the delta function. Um, so, one algorithm to learn this is you pick a hypothesis base of functions h and you minimize the squared error or some empirical error. And you want to say, how well does this f hat do to the best in the class? if you knew the true joint. And here's just some examples. And what you can do is you can say, you look at H, look at the covering number of H, okay, here in the supremum, and look at the metric entropy of that, the log of that. And if the log of that has this property, meaning that it's zero entropy in the limit, then you can learn, okay? And you can give a generalization bound. Okay, so that's what happens in the IID setting. So what happens in the, determ in the dynamics setting, right? What can you say? What can't you say? What conditions do you need? Okay, so examples of this, you have a Markov process, or you have a hidden Markov process where you have Markovian updates and then an observation process, right? Here's a picture of it in terms of the states. And you can ask, should this be stochastic or deterministic, right? And in ecology and other applications, you have both. And the models I'll talk about today, again, you can have both. Okay, so let's set up the, 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 uh, the deterministic dynamics version of this, okay? So what do you have? You have a quadruple, right? You have your space, X, it's a separable metric space. It has a sigma algebra, script X. I have a measurable map, and I have an invariant measure, okay? And I'm gonna assume for the rest of this talk, these are ergodic. Can you generalize that? You want to? We'll touch on that at the end. Okay. And if you notice, these are all being indexed by parameters. So you have a family of parameters. Okay. So you can take this quadruple and just re really reduce it down to this pair, right? You have your map and you have the invariant measure. Okay. Now, what do I tell you about the observational noise? Well, it has some type of conditional likelihood, right? And what I can tell you is I can tell you a model, right, of getting a sequence given initial condition X just by doing iterates, okay? And sometimes what we'll do is we'll try to condition out or marginalize out this initial condition, right, by, in a way, drawing from the stationary measure and integrating it up, okay? 
Here's an example of what you might do for a logistic map. And then this is the dynamic linear model that I told you, which is like a time bearing common filter. These are examples of systems. Okay, so there are many ways of doing inference. I'm gonna talk about today, two of them. I'm gonna talk about Bayesian inference, and hopefully I have time to tell you about empirical risk minimization. Uh, I'm gonna tell you more about Bayesian inference because I'm Bayesian. Um, okay, so you have, a, you have a system T that's generating your data, and we'll consider that as Y up here. Uh, and then there are these tracking systems. So you have a family of systems that you wanna track T with, and that's your S, and it's indexed by theta, right? And these are two different alternative ways you can write it. And then you have a loss or a regret, square loss, for example, and that's just measuring up the errors from your sequence X and your sequence Y. Okay, so the first question I'm gonna do is, if I do a Bayesian procedure, can I prove something called posterior consistency? And I'll tell you what that is, and I'll tell you how to think about that problem. So I told you, in the classic Bayesian setting, you have your observation process, Y1 through Yn, right? And it's being generated, it's generated from true sampling procedures, okay? And this gives you a likelihood. You put a prior over your parameters, and then you have a marginal likelihood. And just Bayes' rule tells you what the posterior over the parameters are given the sequence, right? Just as a statement on conditional probabilities. Very simple example, if you're getting something that IID Bernoulli, I put a beta distribution over the parameter P, and this is my posterior. Really simple example. Okay, so one can ask, does a po posterior distribution concentrate around theta star? Does it concentrate around the true generating process? Right, and there are different notions of this. Uh, so here's the neighborhood S epsilon. Does it concentrate around it? And so in the classical setting, you have a complete metric space. You have these observations. You have a parameter space and a uh, collection of Borel measures. You have a prior, right? And then you can ask this question. This is your posterior in this construction. And then you ask, okay, if yn is iid with density p theta zero, what happens to the posterior as it tends to infinity? Does it concentrate around p theta zero? Or does it concentrate around theta zero? Okay, so the first kind of question about this was answered by Dube, which said for almost every theta and theta, the pair is consistent. Okay? But what about for every theta and theta, right? So. What then happened was for the case where you had finite dimensional parameter spaces, there was a construction and proof by uh, Lorraine Schwartz where she thought about this in terms of test functions. So if you can show effectively the test function at your true theta, right, is separated exponentially from your test function from anywhere else outside that ball, you're good to go. Right, you could almost think about that as a likelihood ratio of the true versus something outside the ball. And as n gets bigger and bigger, those things are going to be exploding away from each other. So that's what they worked out, and that is to be consistent. So this was followed by work showing when you look at infinite dimensional families, this can break apart. Right, and this is a beautiful paper by Diaconis and Friedman, Friedman where they characterize this by kind of geometric ideas. It almost is like a foliation of the parameter space. And then in the 2000s, uh, Shubhashish Kosala and Art van der Waard did a lot of beautiful work proving how you get something that's consistent in the infinite dimensional space. And they played games where they took the idea of Schwartz, but made the space of functions bigger and bigger and bigger. These were called sieves, and somehow showed that that worked nicely. Okay, so, so what happens when you have dependence? This was all done in the IID study. What happens when you have dependence? What can you say? How can you think about it? Okay, so again, this is what I've told you before. In the dependent case, what happens to the posterior as the number of observations go to infinity? So you can set up the same type of, uh, sorry, same type of Bayesian setting, okay? But we'll do something very similar, but slightly different. Again, just to remind you, I have the observation process and I have my tracking process and I have my loss. Everyone's good by that? So now what I'm gonna just tell you is something called a Gibbs posterior, so this is called generalized Bayes, where I exponentiate my loss, look at my prior, and normalize by the partition function, okay? And this is gonna be my Bayesian model. 
Okay. I'm going to ask, is a posterior unique? Does it concentrate around T? Okay, so the motivation for the Gibbs posterior was uh, a theoretic decision, theoretic perspective of Bayes when you don't know the generating process. If it's a negative log likelihood, you get back Bayesian inference. And sometimes this is robust to uh, misspecification of the model. And if you put in a little uh, phi here, which you think of one over T, right, you can try to calibrate it. Okay. Okay, so there's something else called the Gibbs measure. If I have a map S, a potential function F, and a measure mu naught, I can write down this model and, I can, and ask, is there a limit point of this? And if there's a limit point, this is called a Gibbs measure. And if you kind of stare at this and you kind of stare at this, you're like, hmm, there are similarities here, right? So the idea of a Gibbs measure goes back to statistical mechanics. And it's a series of really beautiful work by many people, but a lot of it was by uh, Bowen, Ruel, um, and Sinai. Okay, and I'll give you one example of it. I have a discrete alphabet. I have a left shift, off, left shift operator, which just moves me one step. And then what I have, I have, here we'll just do it with one, forbidden words. So I can't go from this letter to this letter. You can do it with two, three, four. And I just want you to think about this as a Markov chain, right? As a deterministic Markov chain where you're not going in probability, you either can or can't. And so this is a matrix full of zero ones, right? And we call this mixing. If you go far enough in N with positive probability, you can get from any letter to any other letter. So this is called a, um, well, I gave it a name. Well, other people actually really gave it a name. It's a mixing shift of finite type. If you have a mixing shift of finite type, right, you will get a Gibbs measure. And this is a result by Bowen. There you go. And if you look at this mixing shift of finite type, this F right here is called um, the potential in the statistical mechanics literature. And this P here is called the pressure. And what if you stare at this for a little bit and you look at this, you go, hmm, this mu somehow behaves nicely at an exponential level, right? That's what this is telling you basically. Okay, I think I said this. Okay, so our model class, you have a compact metric space, continuously parameterized by a family of Holder continuous potential functions. For each of these data, we have a corresponding Gibbs measure. Okay, so Markov chains of arbitrary orders are included in this model class. And again, this is what my observation density is, right, as before. Um, there are some integrability and regularity conditions on it, and we'll get back to this later, but let's not worry about that right now. So what's my model? I look at the marginal likelihood. Another way of thinking about that is start from a random draw from your, um, from your invariant measure, right? And then run your shift operator to get the new state update, look at your observation process, collect all of those, okay? So let's call P theta Y the distribution of this process. Now it could be that for two different parameters, we get the same law, so we'll just say those are the same. That's my equivalent class. So here's a result that we proved, which is for this construction, if your prior is supported on theta, then you get posterior consistency, okay? Now, I'll tell you why that works. There's something kind of interesting there. Uh, and I'll give you a slight exaggeration of what we did, which is our proof basically takes a theorem in Bowen's book and generalizes it slightly. Now, doing that is non-trivial, but... So now, a more general setting is everything I told you before, but I'm also putting a distribution over my initial condition, right? Instead of marginalizing it out. So in theory, you can do that. One thing I'll tell you, everything I'm telling you now and today is purely statistical convergence. If you ask me anything computational, I'll laugh and say, ha, 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 right? So because God knows how you can do it. But thinking about that is actually an important problem, and I'll touch on that at the end. Okay, so again, this is what I'm telling you as before. Now, why does this work? Why can we prove consistency? And the basic reason why is that there is something that happens to the partition function. In the limit, the partition function has meaning. It converges to something. 
and it actually has a beautiful variational form. Okay, and a really, really key idea here is something that's called a joining, which if I remember correctly was introduced by Furstenberg. Okay, so let's say I have a system X, I have a system Y, it has an invariant measure mu, this has an invariant measure nu. A joining looks at a product measure with marginals mu and nu, right? That's what lambda looks like, and it's on X cross Y. But the important thing is that it respects the dynamics, right? So the dynamics are invariant to the map T cross S. So if you know what a coupling is, right, which you, if you do optimal transport, you know what a coupling is, right? This is a coupling that respects the dynamics, right? So it's a further restriction on your coupling to respect the dynamics, okay? So I have a stationary process X, and I'm thinking about it as a shift map. A joining of X with YN is a stationary bivariate process. Okay, at the end of the day, what I'm telling you is that I have one case, which is a tracking, which is a single process, and the other case, I have a family of them, right? So somehow I have to define a joining between one sequence and a multiple bunch of sequences. So that's what I'm trying to tell you there. And that I call script J, right? Because this is, a, this is my observation, and this is the set that I have with respect to different parameters. Okay, so what we can prove is that under reasonable conditions and semi-continuity and phi, the partition function, if you scale it properly, goes to something, this phi. And it turns out this phi is actually the rate function in the large deviation sense. Okay. Now, let's look at this problem. Now, intuitively, you would hope that the loss, as n goes to infinity, converges, right, if you scale it, right? So that's going to be part of what you're looking at. The other part of it is if I have a measure pi and I have a measure mu, and I look at something that looks like the KL divergence, but I'm doing it on, okay, if you look at a lot of ergodic theory, you replace what you would do with a distribution into partitions, and then refine your partitions as small as possible and kind of show things hold uniformly over all of those partitions. So that's all I'm doing here. I'm doing the same thing. I'm looking at the KL divergence, but over these partitions. Okay? And I'm saying in spirit because I didn't write it down rigorously. Now, what you can show is the partition function is converging to the the loss plus the KL divergence, right? Which is what you would expect, right? Because uh, this is what I just told you happens in the Gibbs case. This is if I want to write down Bayes' rule as an information theoretic perspective. So what am I doing? This is my prior pi saying, find me a measure such that the loss plus the KL divergence from that measure and pi, right? That penalized thing is as small as possible. Further, if you have a Gibbs pressure prior and you look at the pressure itself, this is P, and you look at the argument of that, that'll concentrate around the generating process, right? So you can start thinking about it this way. And uh, an example is a Markov chain, but this generalizes beyond Markov chains, okay? So what, what did we use? We used something called the thermodynamic formalism. We use a theory of joinings, which was by, introduced by Furstenberg. And there's also something called the random dynam thermodynamic formalism, which is, uh, comes from Kiefer. And these are all tools from ergodic theory, okay? Not often used in statistics. Okay, so when we looked at this and we stared at it, we said, okay, hmm, this is interesting. Is there something more basic going on, right? And the thing that's more basic going on is that we have large deviations. So can we look at, think about what we did from the lens of large deviations, right? Is there a limiting variational problem, right? Analyze a variational problem for consistency. And we also here gave an idea that if you have the thermodynamic formalism, you get Bayesian analysis. This is what I was saying. Gibbs measures have a large deviation problem. Was this exponential scaling driving our convergence result? And if we can do this, can we look at other stochastic systems, dynamic systems, as well as systems that aren't finite alphabets, a continuous setting? Okay. So what I'll, show, I'll give you is a summary. If you can provide a conditional deviation behavior on X cross Y, 
So that's a large conditional large deviation result for a single model process. Oh. Um, that's 12 hours off. Uh, provide a, uh, and then provide an exponential continuity condition over the model family. This is sufficient to prove convergence in this Bayesian setting, okay? And we'll talk about these two very soon. Okay, and the reason why we did this is two very different examples, Gibbs processes on shifts of finite type, which are discrete, and continuous time hypermixing stochastic processes, which are continuous, can be analyzed in this way, okay? So this is one way of thinking about large deviations in terms of uh, open sets and soups and infs. Uh, and if you know large deviations, this slide is great. If you don't know large deviations, I think this slide is a little bit easier. You have a sequence of measures, you have a rate function i, and you can kind of sandwich these rate functions in terms of the, this, the, these infs, okay? Another way of thinking about it is if I look at time going as t, and if we look at the distribution, you see it centers around t to the uh, rate function plus a little bit order one noise, right? So it's concentrating. It's concentrating exponentially around the rate function. There's a related version of this, which is called the Laplace principle. And if you want to read about this, the text by Veradon is absolutely beautiful. Okay. So step one is to show that you have this large deviation proper property, and the rate function is actually what I told you before, right? If you can show that for, I don't care if it's IID, I don't care if it's a you know continuous time, I don't care if it's a discrete time, right? Just if you can show that, you're good. And again, if you look at it, we're doing the infimum over joinings. Now the second part is you need exponential continuity, okay? Um, and so. If you can show that this limit for one of them, for one of the thetas, gives you a minus V theta, right? And now I look at V theta in terms of T, it's a family of parameters such that theta T is converging to theta and theta. If I can show you that this convergence, right, at the scale T gives me back V minus V theta, so the same rate function, that's the notion of exponential continuity. So think about it, you're going from theta, right, to V theta, and if you say, as I vary theta, and I look at the, the, uh, the, uh, the V theta, if that kind of has this exponential continuity, I'm really good to go. So what's that telling you? That tells you the large deviation or the rate function as I move along these thetas are really close to each other. They're not changing by very much. Okay, so this, I shouldn't call a proposition. It's actually a theorem, but I don't know. Maybe when I first made this slide, it was a proposition. Uh, um, so yeah, if you have this exponential continuous family with respect to loss L and pi is a Borel measure on theta, then you have this property. And examples of this are mix, mixing shifts of finite type, which I also told you about. Another example are hypermixing processes. Let's see how much time I have. Like 15 minutes? 20? Okay. 20 ish? Okay. Um, okay. The next three slides are really terrible. Um, but let's, 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 instead of reading what's on here, let me try to explain to you what's going on. Okay. What does it mean by something to be hypermixing? It means if I look at a sequence here and I look at a sequence far enough away, right, they're independent. Bottom line, that's what, that, that's what it means, right? So what I'm telling you here is, I have some function L, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at F1 through N that are L separated. And that just means if I look at the intervals, right, let's say M1 is one interval, M prime is, this should be capital M prime, M and capital M prime are separated by L, right? And then each of these are measurable, okay? So this is kind of the blocks I'm looking at. Now what I'm telling you is that there's a beta and there's an alpha and there's a gamma. <laughs> and what am I telling you? If I take the product of all of these functions, right, it's bounded by this, this product, which is just looking at the norm of it. Another way of thinking about it, if things are L separated, 
right? Then if I look at a test function f and a test function g on mu, and I look at it in terms of the products, that's controlled by the norm of f and the norm of g, right? There are various functions, versions of this. There are things called alpha mixing, beta mixing, gamma mixing. These are stronger or weaker versions of all of these, but the basic idea is this is a hypermixing process. And why do you need a hypermixing process? Because if you have a dynamical system and you don't have decaying correlations, you can't do nothing. Okay. So what's interesting about this? This gives us a general framework for posterior consistency. It provides a conditional large deviation result for one family, then you prove exponential continuity and you're good to go. Typically, if you look at the literature on proving Bayes' posterior consistency in Bayesian models, people attack them one by one. They construct these sieves, test likelihood ratios, and they pick them for their model at hand, right? And they show that you get particular testing properties. And what we're saying is there's actually a more general framework. Might it give you the optimal bound? No, because you're assuming less. But there's a general way of thinking about it, okay? And this goes from SPD ideas to symbolic dynamics. Now, if you ask me, okay, what, what dynamical systems can I apply this to? You can apply it to the Vanderpool oscillator. Uh, you could apply it to Lorenz attractors. You can apply it to Axiom A systems. You can apply it to, uh, well, mixing shifts of finite type. So then a natural question you have is, well, okay, can you apply um, this to the logistic map, right? And the answer is no, and I'll tell you why. And I think this is something that we're working on next, and I think it's really interesting. There's something called a Young's Tower, or Young Tower, which tells you that you have a nicely behaved dynamical system that's mixing, but at different scales, right? And you're just stacking these scales. And, and that, this is what I'm writing here. This is what this math is. And, um, you know, a lot of dynamical systems are like that, like the logistic map. Right, and that you're locally shearing something, it folds back on itself. Right now, what's nice about Young Towers is there is a large deviations approach. And let me let me say something about how Lysing Young thought and what was absolutely brilliant. So she was a student of Bowen, and one of the things she did that I think is absolutely amazing is she took this very much. Uh, Bowen was a student of Smale, took this very much non-probabilistic perspective on dynamics that had to do with flows and gradients, and reframed it really in terms of Markov chains, large deviation theories, and just beautiful probability theory. Okay, so there's a large deviation formulation for Young Towers. There is absolutely no continuity. That exponential continuity in the parameters, we don't have it. So then the question is, what happens if you want to say something about this system? What can you do? Do you randomize over the parameters? Do you smooth it with noise? What do you do? And I think that's a really interesting open question. All right, this is what I said. If you have something called the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy, which I'll actually tell you what it, that is later on, um, you actually do have large deviations. Okay. Um, okay. I will talk a little bit about frequentism, even though I'm not sure why anyone should, but I'm, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and I'd get back to re empirical risk minimization because I started with it. Okay, so let's say I have a set of dynamical systems. It's compact. The map, the dynamic map itself is continuous, right? The map, the obs observation map is continuous. You have some lower semi-continuity and you have some, this right here is basically some type of um, yeah, let's just say it's some integrability assumption. And this is just our loss. It could be square loss, but again, this is what we said before. This is your sequence yk. You start at some x, you iterate with one of your parameters, and you look at the observation process. Okay. We saw this in the last talk. This is just the empirical loss, right? You're taking n going to infinity. You're minimizing over your parameter theta. You're minimizing over your initial condition x. Right? And you say, hey, does this converge? Does this they had to converge? Does it converge to something meaningful? So the first question is, what's something meaningful? What's a population quantity? Okay, so if I have two stationary processes, U and V, and I look at the expectation of the loss between them over joinings, this I call my distortion. So now what I can do is I can look at a family, Q of S, which is the inclusion of 
over all of the stationary measures, and I can define, right, this loss over the family. And the set, basically, I look at this over, okay, so this is what I observe. These are all of my choices of random sequences. Each of them are th generated by a theta, and I find the set of theta that minimizes this, right? That's my true population losses. And now I can ask this theta and converge to this theta sub L. Okay. And again, this was work done by my co-authors, uh, Kevin and Andrew, and what they said is, if your system satisfies D1 through D3, you have a lower semi-continuous loss, Y is stationary, and you have um, a, some type of measurability condition, then Y sub L is non-empty and compact, and a sequence of risk minimizations converges to the population quantity, and there exists a sequence of minimum risk estimators that converge almost surely to theta. Okay. So what drives this result? Why, why did they, how were they able to prove this? Okay, so if I have a sequence, I can define a pseudometric between a sequence U and V in terms of well, the number of observations and the P norm. And if P is infinity, it's just a maximum. And then what I can do is I can take a family of sequences and I can look at the covering number again, okay, with respect to this norm D and the a ball of size R. And so this HPU of a size R is the covering number for size R balls, okay? And this is the same thing, but it's shrinking R to zero. So we can define the entropy of a dynamical system, H of S, of this family of dynamical systems as a common value HP, where I'm doing this iterate to get all these sequences. So these are over all of my thetas. I'm doing K iterations and also looking at the output process. And then what I'm gonna do is just look at what is the entropy of, you, of this family of magic, ma massive family of sequences. So what they can show is for any family S of dynamical models satisfying D1 and D3, and some regularity conditions on the observation process. If you have zero entropy, then any sequence of minimum L risk estimates will converge almost surely to theta L. So what's interesting here, this is the analog of what I started my talk with in statistical learning, right, for a dynamical system. In the learning case, it's if and only if. Here it's if. Getting the only if part may be true, but it, it it requires more subtlety. Okay, so here, one of the things they showed is there's an equivalence between topological entropy and other notions of entropy. I didn't write this down, but what they showed is for any P norm, the entropies are more, more are effectively the same. They do something more in this paper, which I didn't discuss. There's something called n widths, which are a really beautiful idea in approximation theory, and they relate this entropy, topological entropy to n, n widths, and this gives you one way of thinking about empirical learning for dynamical systems. So um, let's conclude. What do you do about non-stationary processes? I'm really, really interested in quasi-stationary processes and the applications I'm looking at in dynamical systems, these things are quasi-stationary. Do you want, if you want rates of convergence, you, you, gotta, you gotta give me more, right? If you give me more and give me mixing rates, I can give you rates of convergence, but how can I relax that? How do I think about that more systematically? That's really open. Okay, I think there are a ton of really cool computational challenges here. Almost everything I told you a priori is not computable in any reasonable way, right? So questions of what do you have to add to make things computational? If you look at some of these talks on, um, on, 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 on um, theoretical talks on learning nowadays, you see these beautiful phase diagrams, right? Where things are, you can prove oracle bounds but you can't prove that things are polynomial time computable, and then you have things that are polynomial time computable. And, and what is that for a dynamical system, right? I think that's quite open, and I think that's, um, that's a really interesting question. And how do those scale with n, right? That, that, that's something else. And, and the other thing that I think is really important, there's been a ton of beautiful work done on uh, an optimal transport, right? So one question is, what about, instead of couplings, what do you do in terms of joinings? 
And there is work, there's, there's things called martingale optimal transport. And there's a question is, can you adapt those and make them computational for learning uh, joinings? So we've done some work on mean field limits for recurrent neural networks that have been based on some of these ideas of shifts of finite types, necessary and sufficient conditions for ERM. Uh, are there, is there more that we can do in the terms of the thermodynamic formalism for Bayesian analysis? When is there a limiting variational form? Uh, when is there equilibrium joining? These are questions. Okay, can you do large deviations for other Bayesian analyses? Uh, can you do things in terms of young towers? That's a question. And what happens if you don't have a large deviation result? What happens if you're more in like a KPZ limit, right? Is this still something you can do? Right, so these are all questions. There are people that I've spoken to. Some of them are dynamicists. Some of them are probabilists. Some of them are uh, biologists. And because I've been moving, there are places in Germany and the US that gave me money. And I will stop and I'm really open for questions. Um, yeah, we won't. I won't torture you with axiomatic systems. And thank you. Thank you.